He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Hi, Stephen Price here. Just a warning, this podcast contains violence and quite a bit of bad language, so take care of yourself while you're listening. When we left David Little at the end of the last episode, the jury had convicted him of murder. The judge sentenced him to life in prison with a non-parole period of 11 years. That was December 2019. A lot has happened since then. The most important thing, David Little appealed. The Court of Appeal heard the case in November 2020. The argument's pretty much the same as we heard a couple of episodes ago, toward the end of David Little's trial, when the defence tried to convince the trial judge to throw out the Mr Big confession. Now the defence is trying to convince the Court of Appeal that the confession was unreliable and... uh, Know what? I'm just going to cut to the chase. David Little won. The Court of Appeal overturned his murder conviction. I suppose it's odd when you think about it that a jury can listen to evidence for nine weeks, then deliberate together and reach a solemn conclusion about what happened beyond reasonable doubt and then have a bunch of judges retell the story with a different ending. Judges justify their different endings by pointing to the law. But as we've seen, sometimes the law itself is a contest of stories. Here, the Court of Appeal said David Little's confession to Mr Big was so full of tosh that it was unreliable. The jury shouldn't have been allowed to consider it. After nearly six years, thousands of police and prosecution hours, and probably hundreds of thousands of dollars spent creating and defending this fake world around David Little, the courts have decided it didn't work. It wasn't fit for trial. The Mr Big evidence was tossed out. You'd be forgiven a moment of confusion right about now. Didn't I tell you a couple of episodes ago that the Court of Appeal found the confession was reliable enough to go to the jury? You're right. I did. In 2017, the Court of Appeal applied the same legal rules and found the confession reliable enough. That's why the jury got to hear about it. What's changed? Well, the judges would say a lot more evidence came out at trial and it's now clearer how vulnerable David was and how much pressure he was under to confess. You might remember, that's what David Little's lawyers were saying to the judge at the trial, to try to get her to rule out the confession. And there's some truth in it. But as I said in that episode, having watched the trial where David Little was convicted, I'm not really convinced that we learned much that we didn't know back in 2017. Not really. Maybe there's a more crucial difference. The judges in 2020 were different judges. Three different people with different mums, different favourite movies, different hunches and itches. Maybe they just looked at the case differently. The 2017 bench said David wasn't especially vulnerable. Mr Big and his gang were encouraging him to be honest, and David couldn't have thought lying about the murder would help him get in the gang. Besides, he confessed again later. The jury should get to consider the Mr Big evidence. And maybe, I'm guessing here, Maybe they were also thinking something like, Mr Big Stings are pretty clever. We shouldn't shackle police trying to catch serious criminals. There's quite good reason to think this guy's guilty. The 2020 judges said police exploited David Little's social isolation. He was vulnerable. And they used a manipulative sting that put him under psychological pressure to confess. His confession was full of impossibilities. The Mr Big evidence is too dangerous to rely on. And maybe, I'm guessing again, they were telling themselves something like, Mr Big Stings are wrong. We need to protect people from police overstepping boundaries like this. And it doesn't really look like this guy's guilty. Those aren't differences between the judges about legal rules, or even really about what happened. They're just telling different stories about it. I'm Stephen Price, and this is Mr Little Meets Mr Big, a podcast about whether police can use a story to get to the truth about a murder. The Mr Big sting permits police to do, you know, covertly what they couldn't do overtly. It's just so vulgar that they preyed on him like that, and it's cruel is what it is. When I first read it, 
is very upsetting and, it, and it's upsetting to me now. You know, these are real life outcomes. You might remember the beginning of this series when I met David Little in his lawyer's office. That look of hope and trepidation, that anger at the police's deception. I wanted to know more about the Mr Big Sting and whether it might have led David to falsely confess. In case it's not clear, I didn't set out to reinvestigate the crime. I'm not brave enough to try to interview Mr Pike and Mr Marlin. Oh, just, by the way, did you kill Brett Hall? You know, as part of your drug dealing empire? And I remember David's defence lawyer, Christopher Stevenson, telling me how hard it was to get people to talk to him. That whole area, the uh, Whanganui River Valley and its surrounds, has been, you know, significantly lawless for a long time. And, uh, you know, one of the couple of the people we interviewed, um, you know, as potentially defence witnesses, um, you know, said, said, what goes on the river stays on the river, you know. You want me to say this? What happens? I'm out walking on the riverbanks and I get a bullet in the back, you know? But I did want to learn about how the criminal justice system would deal with Mr Big. And at this point, when the Court of Appeal decision comes out, I think we can conclude that it hasn't done a very good job. Because we've had a mistrial, shocking police disclosure problems, a conviction overturned, and a huge police operation thrown out as unreliable. And we're now back at square one. What that means is that the Crown has to decide whether to start again. They have to choose whether to retry David Little for Brett Hall's murder, this time without using the Mr Big evidence. They could still use his confession to the prison guards, and they could still use the other evidence about things like his shifting statements about the guns and his early morning driving, they could still argue he must have lied about seeing Brett at the campsite on the Sunday. Is that enough? The Crown decides it is. They're going to retry David Little for murder. For me, it's a bit disconcerting. I wanted to tell a story of the trial of David Little. I thought we were getting to the end, but maybe the entire story so far is just a preface. It's hard to tell where you are in a story when the story is happening around you. What happens next? Will there be another trial? And even though any such trial couldn't use Mr Big evidence, we should think about what we make of Mr Big's things. Should we keep using them? And then, what does all this tell us about the criminal justice system? So it's 2021, and the Crown has chosen to put David Little on trial again. Is that unfair on David Little? To have to face trial again? After all this time? All those false starts? And with one big chunk of the evidence against him thrown out? If you think so, I don't blame you. But on the other hand, I can't help but think that without the Mr Big evidence, the case against David Little feels stronger. He certainly had the opportunity to kill Brett, his behaviour was strange, his statements to police were shifty, and at least according to the prison guards, he confessed without any Mr Big Sting going on. That feels like a much simpler case. It's not hamstrung by another confession, the one to Mr Big, full of nonsense that really makes you doubt David had anything to do with Brett's murder. Well, the defence team didn't agree the case was stronger. They went back to court and asked for the whole case to be dismissed on the grounds that there wasn't enough evidence for a jury to reasonably convict David Little. That's a tough argument to win. You have to convince a judge that the evidence is so flimsy and the result so clear-cut that any jury guilty verdict would be unsafe. Just as Simon France heard the case, where in 2021, his decision came out in December, he went through all the evidence that was left after you put aside Mr Big. Was there enough that the next jury could reasonably convict David Little? Well, he said it was clear that David had the opportunity to kill Brett on the Friday. And the unchanged state of the campsite suggested Brett had been killed before his son Damien arrived on the Saturday. 
and David's driving behaviour in the early hours of Sunday morning and his shifting explanations of it were suspicious. But he said that doesn't get you very far. The building dispute motive was just guesswork. There's no forensic evidence like blood or DNA. We don't even know how Brett died. And the judge said the evidence that it was a drug killing creates a more compelling narrative. It's just a better story. In the part of the decision I find most interesting, the judge talks about Tracy Morehouse's evidence. Remember, she's the one who heard someone calling out, hey, hey, help, help, from Brett's campsite, well after David's supposed to have killed Brett. Or it might have been a goat. The judge points out that whether or not you think it's a goat might depend on whether you think David Little is guilty. The judge is picking up on what the experts said. People tend to reason backwards. If we believe David Little's confession, then it's easier to believe the goat explanation. Even though Tracy Morehouse, who's the one who actually heard it, and who knows what a goat sounds like, doesn't think it was, and doesn't seem to be the sort of person who's usually wrong or confused. We probably don't even realise we're doing this, this fitting of the evidence to the confession. The judge says that tells us something about the power of confessions and the way they influence a trial. I think he thinks the same thing about David's odd driving and about the state of the campsite. Those things are ambiguous, but if we start with the confession, our brains reach for the sinister explanation that's consistent with it. The danger of a powerful story is that it can unplug our logical minds. The judge concluded, if you put aside David's confession to the prison guards, there's clear reasonable doubt. Even the Crown agreed with that. That means everything hangs on that confession to the prison guards. What did the judge say about that? He suggested David Little's head must have been spinning at that moment. His old world, his friends and promised riches had been revealed as a hoax, and guards were inducting him into his new world of prison. A guard asks, so... They get the right man? David says, yeah, I was going to hand myself in anyway. The judge says this was a passing comment, with no detail and no caution about his right to remain silent. How much weight can you really give it? The judge said, and I love this sentence, a casual, somewhat odd and unexpected question produces an unexpected answer. And so it did. But another judge might have emphasised that it's a strange answer for an innocent man to give. And that it might be best explained as the answer of a man who knew the game was up, which was the Crown's story all along. Another judge might have thought that a case with a confession like this, and some supporting circumstantial evidence, should be left to a jury to decide. But we're dealing with this judge, with his particular mum and his favourite movies and his hunches and itches. Simon France was one of my lecturers at law school. Most of the students loved him. He was whip-smart, a good communicator, funny in that dry way lawyers like. He made time for us. Sadly, he died early in 2023. I was at his funeral, and he was described as one of the best criminal judges in the country. He wasn't the judge for David Little's nine-week trial that led to his conviction, but as we've heard, he was involved in lots of the hearings on the case over many years. He was the judge in the first trial, the one that was aborted. He knew a lot about the case. All this to say, his take on David's case is as good as anyone's is likely to be. And he said it's hard to put weight on David's confession to the prison guards, and so any jury conviction would be unreasonable. He stopped the case. It's December 2021, about 10 years after Brett Hall went missing. David had been in jail for two years after his arrest and another two after his conviction. But he's not going back, because that's it. It's over. The Crown can't appeal this decision. There's no neat resolution with all the ends tied up, but the defence has won. David Little is a free man. So the trial wasn't just a preface. It's the end of the story, after all. There were reasons I thought the court might stop this trial. The disclosure fiasco, the delays, the issues created by Mr Big... But the idea that the evidence was so inadequate that a jury conviction would be irrational? For me, that's an unexpected answer. 
So then, after all this, what are we to make of Mr Big operations? To start to answer that, let me take you back to a scene from the trial in 2019. Because you could say that David Little's trial involves two Mr Big interviews. Of course, the first one, recorded by police, shows David Little confessing to a murder to someone he thinks is a crime boss, but is actually an undercover police officer. We heard a reenactment of that. All right. I'll tell you the truth. But in the second one, the tables are turned. David Little, through his lawyer, gets to interview Mr Big. The undercover officer who played Mr Big is in the witness box, under oath, being cross-examined before the jury. It's clear there's no love lost between the police and defence lawyers. Things get testy. Christopher Stevenson puts it to Mr Big, who we still only know as Scott, that the object of the Mr Big sting is to get a confession. I wish I could play this for you, but as I told you earlier, I wasn't allowed to record it because police were worried that someone might recognise Scott's voice. But I can tell you what happened. Scott said, No. No, the object of Mr Big isn't to get a confession. Christopher Stevenson said, Are you serious? Are you seriously suggesting the object of this three to four month operation and the concluding meeting is not to get a confession? And Scott says, and he's raising his voice, Are you suggesting that I've sworn on oath on a Bible and I'm not telling the truth? Is that what you're suggesting? He actually holds up the Bible. All the Mr Big police witnesses say the same thing. The purpose of Mr Big isn't to get a confession, it's to put the target in a place where he can feel comfortable about being honest. Mind you, they also say there was no money offered to David Little at the Mr Big interview, when they'd been talking incessantly about the upcoming big payday, and there was a huge pile of cash on the table in front of him. And Scott also told the court that it wasn't a pass-fail job interview, though his own notes say David wouldn't be welcomed on board if he stuck to his claims of innocence. Police say, maybe David Little could think those things, but we didn't tell him so. Mr Little can think whatever he wants. This seems disingenuous. Anyway, police are saying they just wanted the truth. And Christopher Stevenson is saying, you wanted your truth. And Scott says, sorry, I don't follow that, my truth. And Christopher Stevenson says to the officer running the sting, the reality is that Mr Big is a confession production unit, isn't it? And the officer says, that's your reality, it's not mine. Your truth, your reality. They're accusing each other of living in fantasy stories. Let's get real here. Was the objective of Mr Big to get a confession? Of course it was. That was the whole point. Plenty of judges have said that too. But was the objective to get a confession even if David Little didn't do it? Of course it wasn't. They didn't set out to get a false confession. They wanted a true one. The real question is... Does the Mr Big sting itself, with its clever and manipulative psychological techniques, make it too risky that someone will confess when they didn't do it? I want to make a confession of my own. I kind of admire the Mr Big sting. It's sheer ingeniousness. We're brought up to admire tricksters. Bugs Bunny, Brewer Rabbit, Bart Simpson, Puss in Boots, the Pink Panther... Tyrion Lannister, Odysseus, Maui, Ocean's Eleven, and police who catch bad guys using clever deception. MacGyver, Point Break, Die Hard, Jake Peralta, The Fast and the Furious. They're cool, smart, edgy. They play high stakes. They nail the bad guy. The Mr Big operation isn't that far off the plot of The Sting, the most famous movie confidence job of all, where some grifters set up an elaborate fake gambling operation to fleece a powerful crime boss. We love a story like that. It's justice, and it's poetic. And surely the police must be allowed the tools they need to fight crime. The criminals don't have to play fair. The Mr Big sting has caught lots of serious criminals, including murderers who'd escaped justice until they met Mr Big and led him to bodies or murder weapons. Remember Daniel Morecambe, the 13-year-old boy abducted from a bus stop in Queensland? Brett Cowan would have got away with it without Mr Big. In New Zealand, Kamal Reddy led Mr Big to a bridge where he'd buried the bodies of Pakisa Yusuf and her young daughter. On the scales of justice, cases like those surely weigh heavily in favour of Mr Big. 
But David Little's case lets us see another side of Mr Big, the costs. The net result is that small, good family from a small town in New Zealand with a dad with no prior criminal convictions, with kids at school who are doing their best to get on, has been forever changed and damaged by this case, which was like a wrecking ball to their lives. That's Christopher Stevenson again. David and Helen Little said during the trial they'd talk to me afterwards, but they've changed their minds. Police wouldn't talk to me either. But David and Helen are happy for their lawyers to pass on their disgust and outrage about what was done to them. The lawyers hired a psychologist to assess the effects of Mr Big on David Little and his family. Christopher Stevenson didn't want to talk about the sensitive details in the report, but he says... The, the impacts observed by a specialist clinician... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> when I first read it, <coughs> it was very upsetting, and, it, and it's upsetting to me now. You know, these are real-life outcomes. He says he remembers talking to another lawyer who was involved in the defence early on, who'd been listening to the tapes of the sting. You know, I recall him saying to me, you know what, I felt physically nauseated listening to some of this stuff. It's so belittling. It's so manipulative, I actually felt ill. And I've always remembered that, and uh, I think all of us encountered that at some point. They were horrified by the intrusiveness of the sting, the way the police surveilled and bugged David and wormed their way into his life. And also, as defence lawyer Elizabeth Hall says, the betrayal. You know, can you imagine, you know, even in our own personal lives, right, where we, we have an interaction with someone and then we find out that they have a slight ulterior motive that they actually wanted you to, you know, do something for them or something and you feel a little bit hurt and a little bit cut down. Can you imagine the scale of the of the harm that months and months of people pretending to be your friend and pretending to think highly of you and pretending to like you and that you belong and then it's all a complete lie. I've been thinking about that too. Isn't there something especially awful about exploiting a friendship? Taking advantage of loneliness, the wish to belong? Is that something police should do? Is it made worse because they drew up an elaborate psychological profile first to pinpoint his vulnerabilities? It's just so vulgar that they preyed on him like that and it's cruel is what it is. Some of the people in Mr Big Stings are so sucked in by them, their world so entirely reinvented, that when they're arrested and told about the sting, their first instinct is to call the person they think of as their best friend, the undercover police officer. What's more, the police seemed to have no plan about what they'd do if David Little didn't confess. Scott said at the trial they'd regroup and work out what to do. There was not even a plan of how they were going to deal with saying to David, well, you know, actually, here's the thing. For the last few months, you know, we've been lying to you and invading your privacy. They didn't even have a plan to have how they were going to sketch out that conversation. Would they tell him about what they'd done? compensate him for the building jobs he'd had to put off, maybe for the deception and intrusion? You'd have to doubt it. Does Mr Big make police lose perspective? Christopher Stevenson says maybe Mr Big targets aren't the only people harmed by the sting. There's a pretty good argument that it's also very damaging to police, generally, um, to be engaging in these sorts of operations. In Mr Big Stings, police create a world where crime is fine, narcs are punished, hiding evidence of the rape of a young girl as a badge of loyalty, and conversations are often casually racist and sexist. Some critics worry about what this does to Mr Big's targets. Are police teaching them a criminal mindset? Others worry about what it might do to the undercover police. And pretending to be criminals, behaving like the people they're trying to catch, are the police also stooping to their level? Aren't they con artists? Is this good for them? Obviously, life undercover is secretive. You have to live a double life. I sometimes wonder what stories the undercover officers tell their friends and families. And then I wonder, what stories do they tell themselves? If a Mr Big Sting produces a false confession, who are the good guys? <laughs> 
Is Mr. Big an instrument of justice or an instrument of injustice? I keep thinking about a story Mark Stobie told me about prison museums he likes to visit. Remember, he's the Canadian sociologist who wrote about Mr. Big. A number of jails and prisons have been turned into museums. Those break into two types. Half of them, roughly speaking, focus on the crimes that got the people into the prison. And those tend to be the tougher the prison, the better, because of the horrible nature of the crimes. The other half tend to, in terms of their presentation, divorce the prisoners from the crimes that got them in there. And so they look at sort of the small cells, the bad food, the uh, the general unpleasant nature of prison, and uh, say this is a terrible, terrible place that shouldn't be allowed to shouldn't have been allowed to exist in this horrible form, because look at all the mean and terrible things it did to these people. And so if you if you start by looking at the prisoner, you immediately move to questioning the response of the state in dealing with that prisoner in a harsh and punitive way. If you start with the victim of the crime, that tendency disappears. Should we be focusing on the victims of crime or the victims of the police? If there was a museum to Mr. Big, which story should it tell? I want to ask Christopher Stevenson about the police's best argument about Mr Big, the justice it's brought to at least 126 victims and their families, often the sorts of people who don't usually see much justice. It is challenging, isn't it, that you say we know this thing works and it captures bad people, but but do you you also say we'll sacrifice a few innocent people? Because that's, that's, that's the truth of what allowing Mr Big Operations is saying there will be a few innocents who go under the bus here. It's the old maxim. Better that ten guilty people escape than one innocent suffer. If we take that seriously, and we know that Mr Big will spit out at least the occasional false confession that looks like a true one, maybe Mr Big is hard to justify. Then Christopher Stevenson says what I've been thinking for a while. Maybe police should only be allowed to use Mr Big evidence when it leads to a body or a murder weapon. But in the end, he says he doesn't think Mr Big should be used at all. Hopefully the Mr Big operations will stop now because I'm um, assuming that uh, this is a, um, a standardised version of the way they're being run in New Zealand and it's been fully reviewed now. Um, the determination is effectively it's too manipulative, too coercive, and um, you know the evidence obtained is going to be too unreliable. I can't see how you'd come to a different view of things now. It's true that the Court of Appeal judges in David Little's case found the sting manipulative and unreliable, and they may have been the first appellate judges in the world ever to be able to read and listen to the entire sting. But the case was about that one sting the one run on David Little, and it was about his susceptibility to it and his provably wrong explanation to Mr Big. The Supreme Court has said there's no law against Mr Big's things, and the courts will look at them case by case to see whether the confession is sound. I wonder, should there be a law against Mr Big's things, or at least some better regulation of them? The Supreme Court has pointed to the lack of legal rules around Mr Big's things and hinted to Parliament that maybe police should have to get a warrant before running one. I called up Scott Optican to talk about that. He's an associate law professor at the University of Auckland, and he's researched and written about Mr Big Stings. We heard from him back in episode four. He agrees there's a gap in the law. There's an awful lot of police investigations in this country that require a warrant, yeah, that are far less intrusive uh, than, than Mr Big. I mean, there's lots of times when you need a warrant simply to just walk into someone's house and conduct what might be a one-hour search of their property. He says Mr Big Stings open a window on a basic tension at the heart of our criminal justice system. It kind of forces you to to really come to grips with your feeling about the appropriate bounds of policing, and in particular the balance between, you know, effective law enforcement and, and the rights of suspects under criminal investigations. It's sort of weird that Mr Big Stings can sidestep the right to silence and the right to a lawyer. The Mr Big Sting permits police to do, you know, covertly what they couldn't do overtly. 
But on the other hand... I mean, all undercover operations allow you to do covertly what you can't do overtly. I mean, that, that's by their very nature. He thinks police should have to get a warrant before running Mr Big stings, and there should be special rules around when Mr Big evidence can be used. But there's no obvious place to draw the line. You know, you end up kind of paying your money and, and taking your choice as to what you think is the fair and appropriate balance you know, between police being able to investigate crimes covertly and surreptitiously and the point at which you think that kind of investigation treads upon the rights of criminal suspects. But there is no objective reality to any of this. We're back into story again. What story do we as a society want to tell about where to draw that line? Scott Optican thinks we really need to have an open public debate about this and then pass some law targeted at these sorts of stings that reflects how much power we as a society want to give the police and how we want to control it. Because otherwise, it's left up to judges, who themselves say they may not be the best people to be making these calls. Different judges with different orientations and different perceptions of how the law works can come to different conclusions. And they do as we've seen in this very case. Meanwhile, we have no idea what the police's internal rules are on using Mr Big. They wouldn't show me. They wouldn't show David Little's lawyers. They won't show the public. And that means... That policy, that three or four page policy, whatever the police have that they won't show anybody, um, is essentially the, the substitute for the public debate about whether the technique should be used, right? I mean, that's it. <laughs> in some ways, in some, um, here I am advocating for a public you know, debate in Parliament with legislation, and all commissions looked into this. But meanwhile, the police have already had their own internal debate. <laughs> about well, they were at the and, law and commi- they asked the law commission, they said they wouldn't show the policy to the law commission, and I've got a quote yeah, here, because right. it might prejudice <laughs> sensitive investigative measures. Yeah, well, I doubt that. I'm, I'd be very surprised if that's true. As Scott Optican mentioned, in 2018, the Law Commission, together with the Ministry of Justice, looked at Mr Big and other covert operations and found Mr Big's things create risks about reliability, unfairness, intrusion and the undermining of rights like the rights to silence in a lawyer. They recommended the police should have to publish their policies on covert operations, including Mr Big's things. There should be a warrant process and there should be external audits after each sting to see what lessons could be learned. But five years later, the government still hasn't said whether it will follow those recommendations. And so that's why we're in the situation we're in now, which is essentially police can do what they want as long as a court doesn't rule after the fact that it was illegal and or it ended up generating evidence that is inadmissible under New Zealand law. So that's where things stand. The government told me that a response to the Law Commission's recommendations was on its work programme, but hadn't progressed yet. So I asked the police if they're still using Mr Big in the meantime, given that the Law Commission had raised concerns about it. They said it would prejudice the maintenance of the law to tell me. Now, I don't know whether they're still using Mr Big or not, but it does seem to me that if they weren't using it for now, it wouldn't prejudice the maintenance of the law to tell me that. In other developments relevant to David Little's case, the police were fined $75,000 for their disclosure failures. The coroner has found that Brett Hall died sometime on or after Friday the 26th of May, 2011, but he couldn't determine exactly when or where or how. Mr Pike was jailed for serious gun and drug offences, though nothing to do with Brett's disappearance. Detective Sergeant Gleeson has left the police, though I don't mean to suggest that had anything to do with Brett's case either. David's back with his family in Halcombe. But Helen told Stuff's Mike White, David's not the same man after all he's suffered. His kids had a nightmare of a childhood. The police spied on him, hounded him, tricked him, and ruined his life. Helen says they've lost everything, financially. She doesn't think things will ever get back to normal. David and his lawyers are thinking about a civil lawsuit against the police for the Mr Big Sting. And another chapter was recently written in the Little family's dealings with the justice system when David Little's brother Darren was shot dead by police after a standoff at his house in Fielding. He was reportedly suffering mental health issues and had been shooting at the house next door. 
Meanwhile, Brett's body has never been found. The police aren't launching any new investigation into his disappearance. Brett's mother, Lavona, hasn't quite given up hope that someone will come forward with information about what happened and where Brett's body is so she can finally turn the last page in his story. Because for now, Brett's story doesn't have an ending. Sherlock Holmes once told off Watson for his fatal habit of looking at everything from the point of view of story instead of as a scientific exercise. He might have worried that criminal trials have the same problem. A trial is a battle of stories. That's how we resolve the uncertainty at the heart of any criminal trial. While I've been making the series and watching the trial, I've started wondering for the first time whether it's kind of odd that we use a battle of stories to dispense justice. After all, stories make us oversimplify things, leave out the messy bits of reality that don't fit well. They're better when they're neat. Stories entice us with familiar storylines and stock characters. They're fuelled by emotions and morals, which give the events their significance. Stories demand us to populate them with good guys and bad guys. And stories beguile us with siren calls of cause and effect. That last point about cause and effect... I love the way American lawyer Alan Dershowitz puts it. In Chekhovian drama, chest pains are followed by heart attacks, coughs by consumption, life insurance policies by murders, telephone rings by dramatic messages. In real life, most chest pains are indigestion. Coughs are colds. Insurance policies are followed by years of premium payments. And telephone calls are from marketing services. Dershowitz says the one thing we know about life is that it's random. Things don't really happen for a purpose. There's no narrative arc. And if the justice system tells us to superimpose a narrative arc on events, then maybe it's pulling us away from the sort of rigorous analysis that might be more useful. At some level, stories always demand self-deception. Is it really justice that the best story, or the best storyteller, wins? And maybe it's worse than that, because part of the lawyer's job is to convince you that what they say isn't a story. Make it seem real, to make the story possess you. Of course, the evidence they put forward influences our judgment, sometimes powerfully and rightly. But we're also influenced by the bundle of irrationalities that make us human. The impressions, prejudices, what we think of as common sense, what our friends think, what we were brought up to think. I don't trust the police. I don't like the look of him. I don't believe builders. Social science tells us something about how we, and how we as jurors, form these stories, and how they're sometimes irrational. We think a seminary student would help a person ailing in the street, even if they're in a hurry, because that's how seminary students are. We think police training would help police be able to spot a liar. We think an eyewitness who's convincing and confident is likely to be accurate. We think memories are like movies. We think we wouldn't confess to a crime we didn't commit. We think we can ignore someone's confession when we assess other evidence about a crime. We think an innocent person would get up in court and give evidence. These things don't feel like stories to us. They feel like life. Judges warn juries about some of this, but their warnings may not work. David Foster Wallace, the American author and essayist, liked to tell a parable about fish. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, Morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit. And then eventually, one of them looks over at the other and goes, What the hell is water? We're fish, and stories are water. I've come to think, if we tried to come up with another way of dispensing justice, we'd still be swimming in story. I started this series with a quote from Errol Morris. You can escape from a prison, he said. But how can you escape from a convincing story? David Little has escaped the criminal justice system. But I don't think he's really escaped from his story. I don't know that you can ever escape from a story. Mr Big involves the police telling a story to their target. 
They recruit him into their own narrative. It's a dangerous thing, because it creates an incentive for him to make up his own story to please Mr. Big. It's also dangerous, because if he does, it lays the seeds for powerful stories in the minds of the jury. He was willing to commit those crimes? He wants to join the syndicate? Then he must be the kind of guy who'd commit murder. He says he made it up? But who would confess to something they didn't do? The irony is that Mr. Big operations are also the most likely police technique to help us escape story by leading us to a body or other proof so incontrovertible that it must be the truth. But we don't have that in David Little's case. There's no body. There's a gap. How do we fill it? The defence's story is that David Little is an innocent victim, a keen fisherman, sweet to his family, selling fundraising chocolate, helping with building projects at school, prone to a bit of bluster, who got hoodwinked into making up a story about a murder through sophisticated psychological manipulation that preyed on his dreams and his loneliness. The prosecution's story is that he's a callous murderer who slaughtered his friend over a building dispute and was cleverly induced to confess by undercover police who created a situation most likely to get him to honestly open up about it. Authors would say they use story to get to the truth. The police would say that about Mr. Big. The police invent a story around their target. In turn, the target confesses. Maybe it's the truth. Maybe it's a story to get what he wants. The prosecution and defense tell their own stories about what happened. The jury accepts one of those stories. The Court of Appeal accepts the other one. I tell a story around that. So, is Mr. Big the story of a trickster? Or the story of a con artist? Is this the story of a murderer? Or of an innocent victim trapped in his own story? Is it David Little's story? Or Brett's? Or mine? Or is it yours? What story do you tell yourself? Mr Little Meets Mr Big is an RNZ production, written and presented by me, Stephen Price, with support from Victoria University of Wellington and the Michael and Suzanne Boren Foundation. Justin Gregory and Katie Gossett are the executive producers. Tim Watkin is the executive producer of podcasts and series for RNZ. Thanks to the sound engineers, Blair Stagpool, Phil Benge, Mark Chesterman, Rangi Powick and William Saunders. Jeremy Ansel and Steve Burridge are the Auckland and Wellington operations team leaders. The actors were Jack Sargent Shadbolt and Alex Grigg. Duncan Smith was the director. Music composed and performed by Ebony Lamb and Graham Antler. Images by Ebony Lamb. Artwork and design by Jared Bishop and RNZ. You can listen and follow all RNZ podcasts at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Mm-hmm.